Take your Bible, and we'll turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, the last chapter in this series entitled The Return of the King. And it's been mentioned that he is coming back over and over and over in Paul's writing. And over and over and over in the course of these messages that we've looked at over a period of several months. And certainly the return of the king is the subject. But when we look at the return of the king as the great subject and what drives the story, there's also the responsibility of the king's children. The responsibility of Christians that we must respond in light of the fact that he's going to come back in light of the responsibilities that he has left for us to achieve while he is still waiting for his own return. And so the Thessalonians had been grounded in their faith. They had been, they had been guarded in their faith. They were told to make sure to be careful in all the, the, the false spirits, the, the spirit of Antichrist, as well as the person of Antichrist that we looked at really briefly last week. You know, that's a study in and of itself, right? We looked at one chapter, and I stumbled through that with you. But I hope that you'll take more time to look at that because we must be guarded in our faith. And then these Thessalonians were growing in their faith. They were vitally connected to the Lord. They were growing in their relationship with the Lord and with one another. And now they were being called to go out into a world to serve it, to connect with the world. Paul prayed for them at the end of chapter 2. We really didn't look at the extent of those verses, but there's a marvelous passage that we really didn't, really didn't get involved with as I would love to have, to have been involved with in verse 13 of chapter 2. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has chosen from the beginning, He has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. So he, he says, Paul says that God has this, this plan for your life. He has chosen you. He has called you by name. He has done so through the Holy Spirit. So when you sense this tugging in your heart and this, this conviction that comes, this realization that, uh, of truth, and you're now given the opportunity to embrace it, that's the Holy Spirit working in your life. At such a time, you have a choice whether or not you're going to believe the truth. And he says that they believed the truth, that the working of the Spirit of God was taking place in their life, and that this grand plan that God had ordained even before the foundation of the world was unfolding itself even in their very midst. It's a beautiful passage. And so in verse, in verse 15 and so forth, he's praying for them to stand fast and to be comforted in their hearts and to remain steadfast in their relationship with the Lord and with one another. And so in light of the revelation, the unveiling of who Jesus is to them, they are being called to respond, and that's what God wants from us. When he calls us, when he reveals himself, he calls us to respond. He doesn't disclose himself so that he might hear himself. He discloses himself, he makes himself known so that we might respond to the goodness of the Lord. And so we are bound to give thanks always in verse 13 of chapter 2 bound to give thanks all this is what Paul is saying for them but I want you to look in verse 1 because he says finally brethren and notice he addresses this to brothers and sisters in Christ this is a pastoral note at the end of his writing he wants to encourage them he wants them to be strengthened in their faith but now he's he's not praying for them look what he says in, in verse 1 finally brethren pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for all men have not faith. But the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. And so there's this request for prayer. Request for prayer and don't stop waiting on the Lord. There's this Pray for us. We, we need this. Don't just stand there, so to speak, but pray. Don't, you've heard the word. You've received the word, but we're asking that you, would, that you would pray for us and that you would do so in this kind of way. And for everyone who prays this for me, I am, I am so grateful. 
But this is a prayer not only for pastors, but it's a prayer for all of us who are responsible for delivering the Word of God. Ultimately, that's all of us, right? But he's asking them specifically, pray for us that the Word of the Lord may run speedily. That's what it means to have free course. That God's Word would just cut through the hearts of men and, and bring conviction to their hearts so that when it's spoken, that actually there is power that comes, not just somebody rambling with words, but that the power of God would be released through the Word of God and that it would run freely throughout uh, their lives. And that it would speed ahead because Paul was a missionary, right? He was a missionary. He wanted to see the gospel spread. That's the heart of every church, by the way, or it should be the heart of our church that we should want to see the gospel spread, that it would run speedily, that we would, we would deliver the message and that it would find its target and that we would be sensitive to the person we meet at the grocery store, to the friend that we've had for years, to our brother or sister, biologically speaking, or to people that we know that are in our circle of influence, in our sphere of influence, that the word of God would run swiftly to them and that it would find residence in their heart. That's the idea. And that we would pray this way. That we would pray this way. And so he's asking them, pray for this. And that the word of God would be made much of. That's what it means to be glorified. That, that it wouldn't just be some little thing, but that when, when people hear it, they would grasp it and they would want to read it and they would, they would spend some time, they would be like, well, what next? What do I do? And like some of you that I've visited here w recently, that it doesn't matter how much I text you, you say, okay, well, I've read that, right? I've read that already. I've read this. I've read that. And I said, I can't keep up with some of you Christians out there. These new Christians, you know what I'm saying? They go crazy for Jesus. You got to watch them. That's what he's praying for, that the word of God would be, it would be made much of. They, they couldn't get enough of it. Like the Thessalonians, like the Bereans, and a list of other people that Paul went to, and he, he shared the gospel. So when you pray for the gospel, for the word of God, you pray that it would have free course, that it would run speedily, and that once it arrives at the location in which it needs to arrive, that it would be embraced and be made much of, so that when you first came to faith in Christ, what was one of the first desires you had? You wanted to know what was in the Bible. You wanted to know, maybe, you had a, maybe some of you had a background where you were already learning the Bible, I understand that, and that's great, but for many of us, that wasn't the case. And so when once we got saved and the Word of God took up residence, the seed was planted in our heart, all of a sudden, it began to grow. And I wanted to know, like so many of you, I wanted to know what is in the Word of God, what's in it. In fact, I'm still in that same discovery mode today in my life. I just can't read enough of God's Word. Like you, I'm reading through the Bible, or like next year. Anyways, that's going to be the challenge of the whole church. It would change our church next year if we will read the Bible together. By the way, it'll change your home, mom and dad, if you begin to read the Bible together and you begin to read that with your children, just bit by bit, reading through the Word of God. Pray that the Word of the Lord may find residence, that it may take up at the rightful place. And so he was praying that the, the conveying of the Word of God, that is the communication of it, but also the conviction uh, of the Word of God, that it would find that place in men's hearts and that it would take up residence. And he's saying, listen, they're going to be wicked and they're going to be unreasonable people. Have you met anybody like that? Well, you probably know somebody. In fact, maybe you were the unreasonable and wicked person before, right? And, and you came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. There are people that even when you speak to, they they don't reason very well and a part of it is you don't need to get mad at them or anything you don't need to get all self-righteous as a Christian but you just need to know that they have not yet come to know the truth they've not embraced the truth and so the, the, the veil of darkness has not been lifted from their eyes they do not see life di uh, like we see life because we see life according to a biblical worldview they don't see it that way and so they're being blinded by the God of this world. They're in darkness, and, and we're praying for them to come to understand that the, that the blinders will be taken off. But these unreasonable people, when you find someone like that, the worst thing you can do is continue to try to pound them. The best thing you can do is spend five minutes in prayer for them as opposed to five hours trying to, trying to argue with them. You know that? I mean, five minutes. Listen, they may come up with argumentation against what you're saying, but they have no response to your prayers. <laughs> you understand? The Spirit of God can 
pass by all their argumentation and all those obstacles and begin to deal with their heart because you know what happened when you shared the gospel, not your opinion, not the weather, not whatever, not the Astros, you know, all this stuff, right? Okay, we got, I had to, you know I had to make my point there. But you share the word of God and it's a seed planted in the heart of, of somebody that you know. Now what you have to do is pray that, that Satan doesn't come along and steal away that seed. And you've got to pray that the, that the word will take up resonance in their life. So five minutes of prayer will do much more than five hours of argumentation. So don't just stand there, pray, right? Love God and continue to look for his coming in verse 4. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you that you, that you both do and will do the things which we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. There's that additional reference. Remember in every chapter, a reference to the return of the king. We are waiting patiently. We are waiting not, not, you know, not nervously. We know he's coming. We're waiting patiently, expectantly, desiring that in the meantime, while we are waiting for him, that we are about the things that he wants us to be about. And so Paul's affirming them. This is really a letter, a pastoral letter, to affirm them and to encourage them because of the, the confidence that he has in them in verse 4. Um, and it, what God is doing in their life, has been doing in their life, but also he's, he's telling them that there are some commandments. In fact, he's pretty strong with this, just so you get the idea in verse 4. Uh, he's pretty strong. He wants them to understand in verse 4, in verse 6, in verse 10, in verse 11, he uses the word, he uses the words multiple times. He's commanding them to do some things. These are not suggestions. These are not nice little ideas. These are not little Christian things, you know, if you get around to doing them. He's saying these are essential. Do these things. We need it to be done. We, you need it to, to experience the Lord in your life. And so what are these things? He's commanding them, commanding them to pray. Please pray for us. This is our mission, the church. The mission of the church is to deliver the gospel. Pray that it's accepted. Pray that it's accepted and be obedient and faithful in the meantime. Be obedient and faithful in the meantime. Now I want us to look at something else, begin in verse in verse 6, because not only does he request prayer and don't stop waiting on the Lord, but he rebukes the believers. There's a word of correction. Don't stop working for the Lord. In verse 6, he says, now we command you. Again, he's, he's commanding them. This is not a suggestion. It's a present tense imperative verb. In other words, it's not like a nice little idea. Just want to emphasize the weight of what he's saying. This comes with, this comes with apostolic authority. This comes, from, this comes from the heart of God. He says, I, we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that is walking disorderly. Wow. And not after the tradition which he received of us. For yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. He said, we were not living irresponsibly among you. You saw that, right? And you need, to, you need to be careful with those who are living a disorderly life. That's what you, this, is, this is basically the idea is living irresponsibly. In light of what they know, but they're rejecting it. There are some in the midst of the Thessalonian church... That were, that were not living according to what they knew. They were not living according to the truth that Paul had given them, both in his presence as well as in the first letter. Now the second letter, and this second letter, is to encourage them and really to challenge them at their core as a Christian. And maybe as a Christian today, you're going to be challenged at your core. Uh, now this is an interesting passage of Scripture because he's saying that you're to withdraw. Isn't that the word that he uses? He says, withdraw from them. Wow. What is he talking about here? He said, you need, you need to be careful running and hanging out with people who are not serious about the things of God, who are not serious about living responsibly in light of the teachings that Christ has left us. You need to be careful. I mean, the, the fact is, is that who we run with, our associations, help to shape us, inform us, and, and, and really help us to see life, um, in, in, for at least from their point of view. So when he's saying you need to be extremely careful. Now, how could they make such a judgment? You said this, as a matter of fact, this requires judgment. 
And when you look at, at, at what 1 Corinthians talks about, just so you know, you need to read all of 1 Corinthians 5, okay? But there's a messed up situation. There is a Jerry Springer awful situation in 1 Corinthians 5. I mean, you get, now you, get, you know that, right? Some of y'all watching Jerry Springer, you know, watch that, right? I mean, you know, that's always a messed up thing that's going on there. And that's what's happening in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. You read that story, and then you see Paul's response. And Paul's response clearly in 1 Corinthians 15, he talks about don't, don't keep company with these people. Withdraw from them. This is a kind of social ostracism that has taken place, but it requires judgment. So in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 12, let me read it for you, and then you go back and look at the extent of it. Paul writes this, For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? But those who are outside, God judges. Now, if you've never heard that passage of Scripture before, you might think, what, what is he saying? He's saying, judge those brothers who are in the church, but don't judge the people outside the church. Isn't that what he's saying? And, and tell, me what not, tell me what happens most of the time. We get all judgmental about people out there in the world living like lost people. You know, it's like, I can't believe they're living like that. This is what's going on. And I'm not saying there shouldn't be some kind of outrage at, 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 at times. I'm not, okay, we, we, I understand that. But we get all judgmental about the world out there. And then we forget about what's going on in our own family. And we just sort of let anything happen. And what he's saying is you've got to make judgments within now, you, there's a whole lot to this idea of making judgment. Being, being judgmental is wrong no matter when you do that, okay? But exercising judgment is a part of everyday life, and if you have poor judgment, it's going to be reflected in your life. We all exercise judgment. All of us do. And for that person who wants to pontificate about, well, you ought not to judge, well, I just always ask them about everyday things in life. Aren't you making assessments and judgments about life? Generally speaking, yes. You're deciding what is of greatest value and what is uh, of lesser value or no value at all. We're always making assessments and judgments. That's, that's the point. And Paul's point to the Corinthians is, listen, you better look and do some in-house business and do some in-house investigation because uh, uh, some uh, introspection. And if we have a brother or sister in Christ that's walking away from the Lord, we need to note that. In fact, we ought to care enough about them to actually come alongside of them. That's the responsibility of the church. And that's a teaching in and of itself. In fact, we practice as a church. Those of you who have joined here in the last, well, many years, one of the things that you, that you will, that you will uh, encounter is in, in the First Steps book. And uh, one of the things that you'll commit to, we have a whole discussion about what is restoration discipline in the life of the church. What does that look like? What is it, what's its purpose? Its purpose is to deal redemptively, restoratively with someone who is now going astray. We've got to reach out to them. We don't, just, we, don't, we don't sit around and gossiping about people. We've got to reach out to people because we care for them. And that's the responsibility of all of us. That's not the responsibility of two or three in the church. But one of the things that you actually will... in the course of your commitment here, and this may scare you away, those of you who are in my class, we haven't even talked about this yet, but we're going to get into the deep end of the water, right, this next week. So one of the things that you'll sign is a covenant commitment card, and in that covenant commitment card, it says this, if I fail to maintain my commitment to the life of the church, I understand the church may exercise discipline that could lead to the withdrawal of my membership. He said, wow, you, you guys do that here? You Really, you do that? We do. And it's not like with joy, we don't like have a service and, you know, and, and have a, you know, real praise and worship kind of thing, you know, get excited about it. That's nothing. It's, it's a grievous thing. It's a family member that we believe has walked away and it grieves our heart. And it's up to us as a family, just like it would be in your own family, to actually come and grab your son or your daughter, or whoever it is, and say, hey, come on back. Come on back and lovingly confront them. Because if you don't confront them, what does that mean? It means you don't love them. In fact, the Bible says in Hebrews that God chastens those whom he loves. In other words, one of the indications that I'm a child of God is that God loves me and his love shows up in discipline. And that's not something you're going to hear very often in church. But that's what we do. And that's not always an easy thing. It's not a joyful thing. It's a grievous thing. 
The point being is that he, he's saying to these believers at Thessalonica and, and, and in Corinth, and you read Matthew 18 and Galatians chapter 6, and we can talk about any number of passages of Scripture, but there is a, there is a point in which we got to say, hey, that's not the right thing. That's not the right way. And being judgmental means that you are unwilling to confront the person in which there needs to be a, a, a redirection, and you just talk about it. That's not that's not. Discipline, that's, that's gossip, okay? So he's saying, be careful, but these who have walked away, withdraw yourself from them. It mean, doesn't mean we abandon them, but it just it redefines our relationship. Is that, hey, if you continue to walk that direction, that's not wise, that's not good. We make a godly appeal, and it goes on and on and on from there. For you yourselves know how we ought to walk. The bottom line is what Paul is saying is that what you've done is that there's some of you who've lacked the discipline in your life. That's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, that you stop disciplining, you stop disciplining your life to follow after him. And as a result of the lack of discipline in your life, it's causing some repercussions to your life. That's not good for you, and it's certainly not good for the body of Christ. That's the idea. So it's not good for you. Don't you think God knows best? Right? Yeah. Do, do you like it, though, when he corrects you? <laughs> no, in the moment, it's sort of like it stings, doesn't it? And, uh, but, but you know he loves you. I mean, come on now. If anybody loves you, it's him. And, and, and yet, there are times in our lives when there needs to be some correction. Now, in, in some of their cases, in verses 8 through 12, in verses 8 through 12, he challenges those because some of them, the disorderly nature of how they're living... Okay, is that they have stopped working. Physically, they stopped working. This is one of the, 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 the words that is coming to them, this caution that's coming, coming to them. They've stopped working in verse 10. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should they eat. Okay, there's that passage that you like to quote when someone, you know, is not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Well, you don't, you know, you, you don't work, you don't eat, right? Well, there it is right there. Okay, make sure you know it's biblical. Don't just come up with cliches. But what he's saying is that you're not working. You're so heavenly minded. The Lord's coming back. This is probably the reason why they were not working. Although there are some certainly other, I think, viable reasons why they might have not been working. But I think given the context of the return of the king, the Lord's coming back and said, hey, he's coming back. Let's just, let's just uh, let's stop all this work stuff and go over here and just sit and wait for him. Okay, he's coming. It's happening tonight. You know, a few years ago, I don't know if you saw where people bought billboards announcing the return of the Lord. Now, that's a good thing to say Jesus is coming back. But when you set a date, it's like, and then the date passes. It's like Christianity is disparaged. It's like, oh, no, we got one of these guys again. You know, just if you have hundreds of thousands, if you want to sell your estate, people were selling their stuff. And you want to put a billboard up and, it, you know, and you want to say Jesus is coming back. Great. Just don't put a date on it, please. Because if you do as a member of this church, we're going to have to talk to you. You're being disorderly. You know that? It's sort of like, come on now. You, your theology has gotten way up here in your head, and we need to bring it all the way down here to the earth. He's coming back. Nobody's here questioning that. And it may happen in a different kind of way than we, than we understand it. He is coming back. And in the meantime, we need to work. We don't need to put life on pause or hold and say, okay, I'm checking out. Because the rest of you folks, they ain't nothing. Listen, you don't have a clue. You know, it's sort of that self-righteous attitude that comes with some of these folks too. But anyways, let me, let me go on. Verse 11, for we hear that there are some who, who are walking among you that walk disorderly working not at all but they're busybodies. okay on top of this is that not only are they they're 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 not working but they just they got busy about other people's lives they're meddling they're that's what they are they're they're meddling when people don't work it's amazing you know idle hands are a devil is the devil's playground you've heard that expression before i know it's not in the bible but you know it's not a bad one right when you're not doing anything, you're over there twiddling your thumbs, and pretty soon, you know, you're looking at, yeah, the Lord's coming back, he's coming back, and you start adrifting. Yeah, oh, I see you over there, you know, and you, what, what you doing over there? And then you get all real, you know, because you're, you're 
you're spiritual, see? You know, you're all that. And, and the rest of us, we're like something less than, right? So it's this sort of high and mighty kind of attitude. You get busy about other people's lives. Listen, I'm doing all I can right now to live my life for Jesus. I'm, I mean, I'm really, it's, it's hard sometimes to just stay focused on my life, much less to get busy about somebody else's life. I don't mean meddling, okay? It doesn't mean we shouldn't care. That's a different matter. So we need to challenge those who stop listening in verses 13 and 14. Because some, you know, it's sort of like one in one ear and out the other ear. In verse 14, 13, he says, But you, brethren, don't be weary in well-doing. If any man obey not the word by the, of this epistle, note or mark that man. See, he's pretty serious about this. He's mentioning they're disorderly. You need to withdraw from someone like that who's just you know, lost their focus. They need to be reminded. And he says, note this person and have no company with them. That's pretty strong. That he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Remember, he's not your enemy. He is a brother in Christ. And you know, when, you know how it is with family. You you sometimes you don't like what the other person in the family is doing, but you still love them and you still seek to have a relationship with them, right? A at least on some level. You don't have to agree with them. But he is saying that you need to be careful about your relationships with people who are not really on, on track as they should be. So some quick observations, and I want to do this very quickly because this is sort of a, an, an aside to the message. But I, I know I've said some things that, that may be alarming to some of you think, well, you really, you guys judge one another in the church. Well, we're not being judgmental. And I, I want you to understand that the purpose of this is, is to bring us into an accountable relationship. We need each other. We need to be responsible with, with each other. And so discipline is a responsibility that we all have because God has given that to us and we have that toward one another. And when actions of members affect our sense of, uh, doesn't mean that we go around like some kind of CIA, FBI, or whatever else, Lord knows about those things, right? But we don't need to be investigating each other's lives, okay? Please don't do that. But I tell you what it does mean on a very, very, very practical level. It means this. If you get online and start posting ridiculous, foolish, ungodly stuff on Facebook, are you kidding me? Really? All your Facebook friends that are believers and a member of this church ought to say, hey, Joe, I saw what you posted over there. Brother, that, that's, not, that's not good. That's not, that's not sound. That, that's not wise. Um, Let's talk about this, you know? And if they bow up on you, it's sort of like, whoa, Lord, you know, you, you, pray that, you pray that they won't be full of pride. But, you know, it's amazing what people are putting on social media these days. Years ago, when, so, when Facebook was coming around, and we say, oh, Pastor, you gotta, you gotta have Facebook. You ought to have a Facebook account. You ought to have a Facebook account. I said, I don't need a Facebook account. If I get a Facebook account, all the people of my past are gonna find me. And this is not a good thing. <laughs> well, we're finding this whole social media stuff is not all that it's made out to be, okay? I know it can be a good tool for the Lord, but let's redeem it and not allow things to be posted on social media or in other venue, forums, whatever it may be, or just living out in the community. Hey, we ought to care enough for for each other to say, hey, brother. Now, by the way, this necessitates some kind of relationship. So if you see somebody in church today and you don't really know them and yet you've seen them post something uh, keep, in keeping with the illustration, you've seen them post something that's sort of like crazy, but you don't really know them, I would suggest that you maybe take a back seat and do the prayer thing first. Really pray about that, okay? Now, I hope those of, of, of us who do know that person um, that we will actually act on it, okay? So it doesn't, it's not like all of a sudden you're being empowered this morning by the word of God or by the pastor that says, okay, now just pull out your social media guns and boom, you're going to blow everybody out of the water this afternoon. I mean, please don't do that. That's not a wise thing to do. But if you have a relationship with Joe Worley and Joe Worley has posted something which is ridiculous online, I hope that you will say something to that guy, Joe Worley, okay? <laughs> well, anyways, the last thing is we got to conclude. One of the beautiful things about Paul's writing and makes his writing unique is the way he starts his letter in 1 Thessalonians, how he ends it, same way in 2 Thessalonians, and now how he ends it. He started 
with peace and grace. And he finishes them, verse 16. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is the token, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Peace and grace. Peace and grace. Peace by all means. How do you achieve the peace? We have a Father in heaven who sent his Son to reconcile us to him. We can have peace with God. We can have the peace of God because we have peace with God. We have peace. He has reconciled us. Peace and grace. Peace necessitates that a relationship is, is being restored. This is his signature. If you were to identify Paul's, the, the, the manner in which he identified himself, and this is why they were, by the, by the way, this is why they were able to identify that his, this was his true letter. Because there was something at least, most scholars believe there was at least a, a letter that was being circulated that was maybe a fabricated letter that was causing a part of the problem at, at Thessalonica, some of the controversy and some of the upheaval that was taking place there. But this is how you could tell it was Paul because whatever he wrote, whatever he said, you can see it, especially in these letters, but in almost every letter he writes, peace and grace, peace and grace. That's a beautiful way to end a letter. Maybe you have a signature on how you, a signature way that you end things. It sort of, it characterizes you. This is, this is what Paul does here. It, it, this this re- reconciled relationships that you would have peace with God and you would have peace with others. That you have peace with God and that you have peace with others. Peace with God is accomplished through the Lord Jesus Christ who came and died. The battle is over. He's won the victory. He died a death on our behalf. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says just like Paul wrote to them, This God who has chosen you before the foundation of the world, it's through the sanctification of the Spirit. It was through the belief in the Word. What is the Word? The Word is this, that Jesus, the Word, came down from heaven, the Logos, and He came and He dwelt among us, and He died a sinless death, that if we will believe in Jesus, we will be reconciled to God the Father. We were the ones with our back turned toward God. It wasn't God's back back turned toward us we turned our back toward God we walked away and we thought it was okay for a part of our life until we came to know Jesus and we realized that in turning to him turning away from our sin and turning to the Lord Jesus Christ we could be reconciled we could be brought to a place of peace and when we were at peace with God then relationships in our lives change they change and so he says peace and grace He starts with grace, he finishes with grace. In theological terms, these are the bookends or what some call the inclusio. That is the beginning and the end. You believed in Jesus. It started with grace. And our lives are sustained by grace. And one day there will be a period at the end of our lives and it will end by the grace of God. May the peace and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be upon you. Let's pray. Lord, you are gracious to us, far more than what we deserve, and we love you for it. And we celebrate your goodness toward us. We thank you for all that you do. How undeserving, and yet how grateful we are that you would be merciful, that you would give us what we don't deserve that you would restore us and you would bring us back to the place that you wanted us from the very beginning of time and I pray for your peace and your grace in every life here this morning that if someone is struggling with that unrest and maybe just where they are spiritually speaking that they would just they could right now confess their sin to you, knowing that you are faithful and just to forgive them. They would just simply say, Lord, I'm not, I haven't been where I need to be, but by your grace, I'm coming back. By your grace, I'm, in fact, Lord, by your grace, I'm back. We thank you for that. I love you in Jesus' name.